Hello, welcome back. We are on chapter 21 of Mater Materials Kinetics, which is relaxation of glasses and polymers. Um, so I would like to start today by reminding you of this volume temperature diagram, uh, which we saw in the previous lecture about the glass transition. Um, this was showing us how we got to be into the glassy state coming from the liquid state. Basically, if you have some liquid, it takes time for the uh, atoms and the disordered liquid to rearrange themselves into an ordered crystalline configuration. And so if you can cool the liquid um, so fast that it doesn't have time to crystallize, you will get a metastable state called the supercooled liquid. As you continue to cool the supercooled liquid, the viscosity increases by orders of magnitude, and eventually the time scales involved with the supercooled liquid flowing uh, become long compared to the time scales that we're observing the system. And when that happens, we get the glass transformation or the glass transition, where there is this gradual freezing in of the supercooled liquid into the glassy structure. And one of the interesting things about the glassy state is because it is out of equilibrium, the properties of the glass depend not just on the chemistry of the glass and the temperature and the pressure, but also on the entire thermal history. So this figure is showing that a fast cooled glass has um, usually a higher molar volume compared to a more slowly cooled glass. Now, one of the properties then that we define to account for this thermal history dependence of glass properties is called the fictive temperature. And we got the fictive temperature by uh, drawing a tangent line to one of these glass lines and seeing where it intersects the supercooled liquid line. And the temperature at which that intersects is a, kind of like where the structure of the supercooled liquid freezes into the glassy state. And that is called the fictive temperature. So it is an additional order parameter that is used to help define the non-equilibrium thermodynamic state of the glass. And what we saw was that for the fast cooled glass, because um, it is cooled more quickly, uh, this means that the system has less time to stay in its metastable supercooled liquid equilibrium. And therefore, it falls out of equilibrium at a higher temperature that corresponds to a higher fictive temperature labeled here as TF2. On the other hand, if you cool the system more slowly, it's able to stay in that metastable supercooled liquid uh, equilibrium for a bit longer, falling out of equilibrium at lower temperatures, and therefore that corresponds to a lower fictive temperature labeled here as TF1. So even though fictive temperature is not an exact description of the non-equilibrium state of the glass, it is the most convenient way to uh, define an additional parameter that gives us some more information about the thermal history of the glass and the thermal history dependence of glass properties. Now, the other important relation I wanted to bring up here is called the Maxwell relation, and this connects the viscosity of the supercooled liquid or glass, which is labeled here as eta on the left-hand side of the equation, with the relaxation time of the system tau. And the proportionality constant between the viscosity and the relaxation time is the shear modulus g. So what you will see in this lecture and in a lot of the literature on this topic of relaxation is that the viscosity is often used as a stand-in for the relaxation time or vice versa. And that is because they are proportional to each other or mostly proportional to each other where that proportionality constant is given by the shear modulus. So let us keep that in mind. Um, but what I want to get into first in this lecture is a bit more detail on the concept of the fictive temperature itself. Um, now, this notion of a fictive temperature was first introduced by uh, the scientist here, Arthur Quincy Toole. Um, this was back in 1931. This was the, the first appearance of fictive temperature in the literature. And in this paper by Toole and Eichlin, um, they write, that the physico-chemical condition or state of a glass is reasonably well known only when both the actual temperature and that other temperature at which the glass would be in equilibrium if heated or cooled very rapidly to it are known. This latter temperature has been termed the equilibrium or fictive temperature of the glass. 
So this was the first time that someone proposed uh, an additional parameter to describe that non-equilibrium state of the glass, and the first appearance then of this term fictive temperature. And the word fictive here literally means fictional. It is an, an artificial temper temperature that is made up uh, in order to act as an order parameter to give us this information about the thermal history of the glass. And, and later on, Tool had a second paper. This is in 1946. You can see the references here at the bottom, both in Journal of the American Ceramic Society, um, that the evolution of the fictive temperature during the relaxation process is given by um, this equation, which is known as Tool's equation. So the left-hand side of the equation is the time rate of change of the fictive temperature. Um, the system is going to be approaching equilibrium by changing its fictive temperature as the glass relaxes towards the supercooled liquid state. On the right-hand side of the equation, there are two parts to this. Uh, in the numerator, we have T minus TF. That is the thermodynamic driving force for um, the relaxation process. So this is the difference between the fictive temperature of the glass uh, versus the actual physical temperature T. And what this is is a thermodynamic driving force that will cause the glass to relax towards its metastable supercooled liquid state. Um, so that numerator then is the thermodynamic driving force. The denominator here is giving the kinetic rate parameter, or in this case, it's one over the kinetic rate parameter because it is tau, the relaxation time, which is a function of not just temperature, but also thermal history, as we know from our previous lecture on the non-equilibrium viscosity of glass. And of course, this tau here connects back to the viscosity via this Maxwell relation. And um, that's why the, that you know, sometimes we treat this um, in terms of tau. Sometimes we use um, the viscosity with the um, proportionality constant as a stand-in for the relaxation time. Uh, but what Tool's equation is telling us is that if the, if the fictive temperature of the system is not equal to the actual physical temperature T, then there is a thermodynamic driving force for relaxation, and that relaxation will occur on a time scale of tau. Uh, Tool's equation will tell us that this relaxation continues until T is equal to TF. At that point, the relaxation would stop because the thermodynamic driving force is gone. Um, so that was the original introduction of the concept of fictive temperature. Um, the first scientist who um, kind of connected this back to glass structure was Edward Condon. Um, he is, of course, most well known for his work in um, quantum mechanics, like the, the Condon-Morse curve, um, a very distinguished nuclear physicist and a pioneer of the field of quantum mechanics. Um, he had a brief stint at Corning Glassworks, where he served as director of research and development from 1951 to 1954. And during that time, he did a little bit of exploration into the concept of fictive temperature, uh, publishing this paper in 1954, where um, he defined fictive temperature as follows. He said, for temperature T below the transformation range, the material is said to have a fictive temperature TF if it is in the state produced by rapid quenching from complete equilibrium at temperature T equals TF. So what this is saying, if we go back to our volume temperature diagram, the fixed temperature is as if you take the supercooled liquid, and let's consider this TF2 here, if you were to hold the supercooled liquid at the desired fictive temperature TF2 for a long enough time to equilibrate it there, and then rapidly quench um, that the structure and the state of the glass that is frozen in would correspond to the structure of the supercooled liquid at that fictive temperature. So what Condon is saying is, is kind of a slight variation on the normal continuous glass transition given by the smooth curve here on top, where um, instead of this smooth glass transition, he's saying, if you take the supercooled liquid, hold it for long enough to equilib equilibrate at the TF and then very rapidly quench, then that's the structure that gets frozen in. Um, now, uh, another monumental paper here on the nature of fictive temperature is from Gardon and Narayana Swami from 1970. 
And um, they published this paper saying that the fictive temperature may be thought of as that temperature from which the glass must be rapidly quenched to produce its particular structural state. For the present treatment, the fictive temperature of the material needs to be defined not only in its final glassy state, but also at all times as it passes through the transformation range. So what this is implying is that the fictive temperature is not just something we define in the final glassy state, but there is a fictive temperature that can be defined during the entire cooling curve. Um, so for example, if we consider this volume temperature diagram on the upper right, there's the liquid or supercooled liquid state at high temperatures. You can see the curved region here is the glass transition region, and then the glassy state here at lower temperatures. Now, the normal way to get the fictive temperature is to draw this tangent line from the glassy curve to see where it intersects with the supercooled liquid line, and that gives you this final fictive temperature here. Now, what Gardon and Narayana Swami are saying that is that at any point here in this glass transition range, you could take a line parallel to the glass line and go through any point here. This is point P. If you go through point P, and see where that intersects uh, this point P prime on the liquid line and drop that down to the temperature axis. That corresponds to the fictive temperature at that particular point during the glass transition process. And if you were to continue this all the way up to the liquid state, at the liquid state, the intersection occurs at the actual temperature. And so in the liquid state at equilibrium, the T is equal to Tf. Now, another figure from their paper is shown on the bottom right, and this is showing um, as the temperature of the system is lowered. So this is temperature as a function of time here. Um, we start off in high temperature in the liquid state. We go through this glass transformation range, and then the temperatures cool down all the way to room temperature. As that happens, uh, the fixed temperature uh, initially is equal to the physical temperature because initially the system is in the equilibrium liquid state. Uh, as we cool down into the glass transformation zone, uh, that's when the um, kinetics start to slow down enough that we fall out of equilibrium. What this means is that the fictive temperature lags behind the physical temperature, and we get this gradual freezing in of the fictive temperature into this TFR, which is the residual fictive temperature of the glass brought all the way down from room temperature. So you can see here at high temperatures, the um, fictive temperature is equal to the physical temperature. They become unequal as the system is cooled through the glass transition range, and then the fictive temperature becomes frozen in at a much higher temperature compared to uh, the actual physical temperature, which in this case has gone down to room temperature. Um, now, this idea that um, fictive temperature points back to a particular structural state um, was critically examined by another scientist at Corning, um, H. N. Ritland, in this famous experiment known as the Ritland crossover experiment. Um, this was published back in 1956. About seven years later, I believe 1963, in the polymers community, a scientist Kovach did exactly the same experiment for polymer systems and got exactly the same result. Um, I believe he was unaware of the work done by Ritlin in the inorganic glass community. So within the polymers community, it's known as the Kovach effect, but the original experiment was done in the inorganic glass community by Ritlin. Um, and so we call this the Ritlin um, crossover experiment. So Ritlin in his paper said, in this description, the structural state of the glass is specified by that temperature, the fictive temperature, at which the structure is the equilibrium one. Experimental data are presented which show, however, that such a one parameter description has only a limited quantitative significance. Now, what Ritland did with his crossover experiment is he prepared two identical glass chemistries. So two samples that had exactly the same glass chemistry and exactly the same fictive temperature. But he arrived at that fictive temperature two different ways. Um, and one, one way, the one that's labeled here as soak, the one that corresponds to this horizontal line, that was following um, Condon's notion of taking the supercooled liquid, holding it for a long period of time at this desired fictive temperature, 
and then rapidly quenching it. So it's soaking it at the desired fictive temperature and then rapidly quenching it. Um, now, the other ones, the open points here, are the rate cooled glass. This corresponds to uh, having a linear cooling rate um, and then basically undergoing a continuous glass transition as the fictive temperature gradually freezes in. And in this case, Ritland was using the refractive index of the glass as a stand-in for the fictive temperature. So a uh, lower refractive index would correspond to a more open structure and therefore a higher fictive temperature. And in this, in this case, he had two samples that had the same refractive index in the final glass, but just arrived there by two different thermal histories. Since they have the same refractive index, they would have the same fictive temperature. And then what Ritlin did was he took those two glasses and then he put them back in a furnace at the, where the furnace was set to the fictive temperature. And this fictive temperature is the same for both samples. And then he um, kept the glass in that furnace and watched whether or not there would be relaxation behavior. Now, according to tools equation, with tools equation, if we go back here, if the temperature is equal to the fictive temperature, which is what, what Ritlin did, he had a glass that had um, a, fict a particular fictive temperature. He set the furnace to exactly that fictive temperature. So according to tools equation, this should be zero. There should be no thermodynamic driving force for relaxation. And that is exactly what was observed for this case of the soaked sample. So the one that was held and equilibrated at the fictive temperature and rapidly quenched, indeed, that did not change its refractive index, meaning that it did not exhibit relaxation behavior. However, the other sample, the one that was rate cooled following a linear cooling path, um, take a look at what happened here. So it started off at its um, equilibrium refractive index, uh, it relaxed away from equilibrium. After some time, after about 45 minutes or so, it went through a minimum here and it turned around and relaxed from the other side and then eventually ended up um, equilibrating from the other side. So it was it appeared to be relaxing away from equilibrium before turning around and relaxing toward equilibrium again. Now, Ritland's conclusion here was that there is a fundamental limitation to the concept of fictive temperature, and having a single fictive temperature is insufficient to give a complete description of the non-equilibrium state of the glass itself. And so this was pointing to the need to have more than one fictive temperature to give uh, a more comprehensive description of that, um, of that thermodynamic state. So, um, it was actually a beautiful experiment there. Now, this um, problem was addressed initially by Narayana Swami in 1971, where he introduced the concept of a memory integral, uh, where he said, the memory integral indicates that any non-equilibrium state is actually a mixture of several equilibrium states. And he proposed this mathematical formulation, which considers um, the non-equilibrium glassy state to be some mixture of equilibrium supercooled liquids. And mathematically, he was able to show that he could capture this Ritland crossover effect, where here you can see that um, you know there's some relaxation modes that are happening on a uh, faster time scale, relaxing in one direction other relaxation modes happening on a slower time scale, relaxing in the other direction. And um, so this was able to give relaxation away from equilibrium before turning around and then relaxing towards equilibrium. So mathematically, he was able to capture this. Uh, physically, however, this um, doesn't make sense. So uh, this notion that a non-equilibrium state is actually a mixture of several equilibrium states is just incorrect. Um, a non-equilibrium state is unique, and in general, a non-equilibrium state cannot be uh, described as a mixture of several equilibrium states. So there was some, um, you know, mathematical insights here, but based on some um, shaky physics. Now that was all in terms of kind of a, a structural or a microscopic view of fictive temperature. Um, another interpretation of fictive temperature uh, in the macroscopic sense. Uh, has also been used throughout the field. And a lot of this work was pioneered by uh, Professor Cornelius Moynihan from RPI. 
And Moynihan's uh, famous paper here in 1976 says fictive temperatures for the same glass in the same non-equilibrium state calculated from different properties are not necessarily identical. And what this means is that if we think about um, fictive temperature, meaning that the uh, the properties of the glass point back to the corresponding properties of the supercooled liquid, um, you could get different values of fictive temperature if you use different properties. Like if you use density, you might get a different fictive temperature compared to refractive index, which might be different compared to enthalpy. Um, and so this was another limitation of this concept of fictive temperature. Basically, it states that you need a separate fictive temperature for each property. Um, now, the, Moynihan's work was uh, generalized and extended here uh, by Yuancheng Yue from Aalborg University. And this was particularly for glasses that are uh, well outside of equilibrium. So Yue has done a lot of work on fiberglass, and fiberglass is quenched very rapidly. So it has an extremely high cooling rate, up to like a million Kelvin per second. Um, and that means that the, the glass that is formed by this hyperquenched route is very much further out of equilibrium compared to uh, glasses made via normal cooling rates. And um, UA extended Moynihan's approach to be able to get, uh, in this case, it's a calorimetric fictive temperature for these systems that are well outside of, of equilibrium. So it's based on one particular property, which is the enthalpy. And the way that he did it was with, for, with the so-called bird method, where um, if you have a glass that has some unknown thermal history, you'd put that in your DSC, your differential scanning calorimeter, heat it up at a standard heating rate of 10 Kelvin per minute, and that gives you the CP1 curve. And it gets heated up all the way till you get to the higher temperature supercooled liquid state where it has equilibrated. Then that liquid sample is cooled back down using the standard cooling rate of 10 uh, Kelvin per minute. So it's the standard known rate. And then heated back up a second time at that same scan rate, 10 Kelvin per minute. That second heating gives you the second heat capacity curve here, which is labeled as CP2. And if you take the bounds of this CP1 curve and CP2 curve, it kind of gives the shape that looks kind of like a bird. And that's how it got the name here for um, as being called the bird method. Now, if we integrate the area here between these two curves, so all of the shaded area here labeled as A, that integral uh, between these two heat capacity curves gives us the enthalpy difference between um, the glass, between the as formed glass, so the one with the unknown thermal history that have been hyperquenched somehow, and then the glass that has the known imposed standard thermal history of 10 Kelvin per second. And so integrating between those two curves gives us the enthalpy difference um, between the this, this same glass sample that has two different thermal histories. Um, now, in order to get the fictive temperature of the unknown sample, what we need to do is compare that to um, the, the known fictive temperature then with the known um, thermal history profile. So with the known standard cooling rate and reheating rate of 10 Kelvin per minute, the fictive temperature in that case is equal to the glass transition temperature, uh, which can be um, determined uh, based on intersection of um, two lines here uh, from this heat capacity curve, which in this case is 941 Kelvin. And if you um, take that curve here for the CP2, everything that falls above this vibrational line here is the configurational part of the heat capacity. And so this shaded area here, B, this uh, shaded area in the opposite direction, this is all the configurational contributions to the enthalpy um, from the, the glass with the known thermal history all the way up to some upper limit of the integral uh, which in this case is TF equals 1155. And the way that this bird method works is that the upper limit of this integral is adjusted such that the, the shaded B area here is equal to this area A that is enclosed within the bird itself. So you've got this known area here within the bird itself, this area A, 
and then you adjust the upper limit of this B integral such that you get an area matching. The area matching corresponds to a matching of the enthalpy, and then this upper limit then is the fictive temperature of the glass with the unknown thermal history. So it is the fictive temperature of the hyperquenched glass. Um, so this is a generalized approach um, for getting fictive temperature. That being said, it is just for one property for the enthalpy and um, would only give you one value of fictive temperature. Um, this is kind of a, a more general step-by-step -step way of, of doing this, where this step one here shown in the upper plot is um, for this the second um, glass with a known thermal history, you get that standard fictive temperature following this Moynihan approach um, using the standard rate where the fictive temperature is equal to the glass transition temperature. This is the middle step here is um, shading in the area within the bird that gives you the enthalpy difference between the unknown and the known thermal histories. And then this is another way of uh, describing this enthalpy matching technique where it's between the known fictive temperature of the rejuvenated glass, the, this, the glass that has undergone its um, imposed thermal history at the standard rate, that's the TF2, and then the TF1, which is the um, unknown glass. And basically by matching the areas of these integrals, it's an enthalpy matching approach. Now, we've had a microscopic definition of fictive temperature based on structure, a macroscopic definition of fictive temperature based on property, such as enthalpy. Um, a third interpretation of fictive temperature is the kinetic. <coughs> So the third interpretation of fictive temperature is the kinetic interpretation, and this is the one that directly addresses um, the problem that Ritland identified with fictive temperature via his crossover experiment, and that is the need to define more than one fictive temperature. Now, some of the pioneering work in this area was done by Simon Rexon back in 1986. And in his paper, he said, the model characterizes the glassy state by a broad distribution of partial fictive temperatures, low produced by fast relaxation mechanisms and high produced by slow mechanisms. And so what he's considering here is that this TF curve which you can see this is relaxation, so uh, the TF is evolving with time here, that he's capturing a non-monotonic relaxation behavior where this uh, average fictive temperature is relaxing first away from an equilibrium, turning around and then towards equilibrium again. And that the reason for this is that this TF is actually an average fictive temperature uh, where it's an average of what's called partial fictive temperatures here, uh, also known as fictive temperature components that occur on different time scales. So in this case, this TF is some average of this TF53. This TF53 was um, frozen in at much higher temperatures, which means that it has a much slower relaxation response. And then the other one being this TF34, which was frozen in at much lower fictive temperatures because it is a faster process. Now, if you take the system that has an average fictive temperature, that is an average of these two partial fictive temperatures, and now hold it at a temperature that's somewhere in the middle, so somewhere between the two partial fictive temperatures, and just hold it there isothermally and watch it relax, what happens is that that average fictive, fictive temperature will relax away from equilibrium, turn around, and then relax towards it. And the reason is um, not because it disobeys tools equation, but because tools equation needs to be used for these partial fictive temperature components. So if you take this TF34, you note that this relaxes monotonically. It's always relaxing in the same direction. So this TF34 is following tools equation, and this is happening at a time scale that is relatively short here, say on the order of a minute or so, a few minutes. And this is relaxing from a lower fictive temperature towards the equilibrium here. On the other hand, this TF53 is a much slower relaxation mode. And this is relaxing from the other side. And it's relaxing on a much longer time scale. You see, by the time this TF34 has reached equilibrium, uh, the TF53 hasn't even started yet. And the reason that we have 
um, this non-monotonic relaxation behavior of the average TF is because you've got, in this case, two different partial fictive temperatures that are relaxing from different directions on different time scales. This one relaxing from below to above to going upward on a fast time scale. That's what gives you this initial increase. And then after that one equilibrates on a much lower time or much slower time scale, relaxing from the other side. And it's not until all of the fictive temperature components reach equilibrium that the average fictive temperature reaches equilibrium and that the system is truly in equilibrium. And so this is um, kind of the state of the art of relaxation modeling now is in terms of this kinetic interpretation of fictive temperature. But to summarize um, what we've covered in terms of three interpretations of fictive temperature, there is the microscopic interpretation, which is um, viewing fictive temperature as where the structure of the supercooled liquid freezes into that of the glassy state. The macroscopic definition of fictive temperature based on uh, matching of properties between the glassy and supercooled liquid states, such as enthalpy, mapping, or enthalpy matching. And then the kinetic interpretation, um, which uh, considers that the fictive temperature is really an average fictive temperature, averaging over several different um, partial fictive temperatures that relax in different time scales. And this is the interpretation that we're going to be dealing with for the rest of this lecture. Now, why is relaxation behavior so important? It is uh, an inherent property of any glass uh, and any um, polymer that's in the glassy state. And that means that the properties of glasses are continuously evolving. If you heat treat them, they will relax faster compared to at lower temperatures. And it has a, a lot of um, technological implications. So for example, for glasses that are used as substrates for liquid crystal displays. Those glass substrates, um, when the displays are built on them, they uh, go through a heat treatment process where the glass is heated up. The thin film electronics are deposited onto the glass substrate to get the individual pixels. Um, and then the glass is cooled back down again. And during that heat treatment process, the glass is relaxing, which means it's changing dimensions, and that can lead to misalignment of the pixels. Chemically strengthened glass as well, so that the stress generation and relaxation behaviors have a big impact on the mechanical properties of that glass. Uh, for optical fiber, um, the main optical loss mechanism is Rayleigh scattering, and Rayleigh scattering is a function of thermal history and the relaxation of density fluctuations in the glass. So relaxation is everywhere, and there are many important aspects of relaxation. There is the temperature dependence of the relaxation process, which via the Maxwell relation connects back to the liquid and supercooled liquid viscosity. There's the thermal history dependence, which connects back to the non-equilibrium viscosity of glass. The time dependence, which as we will see is described by a stretched exponential function. Um, it can also depend on what property is being measured. And of course, there's also a very big composition dependence of the relaxation process. Um, so let's focus now on the time dependence of the relaxation piece. And the equation that describes that is the stretched exponential relaxation function, also known as the Kohlrush function or the Kohlrush-Williams-Watts function. Um, this was first proposed empirically by Kohlrush back in 1847. And he was studying the uh, decay of charge on a Leyden jar and found that it didn't obey simple exponential decay here shown with a blue curve. But if you were to take that simple ex exponential decay here and just raise the argument of the exponential to some power beta, where beta is a dimensionless parameter known as the stretching exponent, and is somewhere between zero and one, that the introduction of this one additional parameter here, beta, changes the shape of the curve. And it's almost like if you take this blue curve and stretch it out, where the relaxation happens faster at short times and slower at long times, this gives us the stretched exponential relaxation function, and this provides a much more accurate description of relaxation behavior compared to simple exponential decay. Now, this was proposed back just empirically back in 1847 based on being a simple function that captures the observed uh, physics, um, but 
you know, doesn't necessarily have a mathematical underpinning. Um, this was kind of an unsolved problem for about 150 years after uh, it had been proposed. And one of the big breakthroughs came um, with Jim Phillips and his development of the diffusion trap model, which showed that if you assume that the non-equilibrium glassy state has some uniform distribution of excitations and the relaxation occurs as these um, excitations um, diffuse to also uniformly distributed traps, that some of the excitations are going to be closer to the traps. Those will relax in a short relaxation time. Other excitations are farther away from the traps. Those would relax in a longer relaxation time. And if you consider all of them together, that combined, they will give you the um, functional form of the stretched exponential decay function. So not only that, but this stretching exponent here, beta, uh, which had previously been, been considered to be just a, an empirical fitting parameter, actually has physical meaning related to the dimensionality of the relaxation pathways, where this D star here is an effective dimensionality of the relaxation pathways, and beta is equal to D star over D star plus two. So Jim Phillips used this approach to, um, to propose that there were two kind of special or magic values of beta equal to three-fifths when it's three-dimensional relaxation or three-sevenths, when there is a fractal dimensionality of relaxation equal to three halves. Basically, the assumption there is that there's an equal partitioning of the um, relaxation pathways into short and long range modes. And that if all the short range things happened already, all that's left is long range behavior. And that would give you a fractal dimensionality of three halves. Sticking three halves in this equation gives you a beta equals three sevenths. And so what he proposed is that for a homogeneous system, that the um, relaxation exponent should be either three-fifths or three-sevenths. Now, um, the next up is some experimental validation of this. And this is work that was done uh, by us at Corning. So let's start with Eagle XG glass, which is the glass that is found on most flat panel displays. Um, what we did here was to uh, consider a stress relaxation experiment where there was a beam of Eagle XG glass and that that beam was held at some constant temperature and held on at a particular um, deflection. And then we measured how much stress is required to maintain that constant deflection. What you're seeing here on the left are different levels of that constant deflection here and the stress that's required to maintain that deflection. So a higher deflection here means more strain, and of course, a greater amount of stress is needed to get to that higher strain. Um, now, the initial response of the glass is elastic, meaning that if you were to just apply that stress and immediately release it, that the beam would spring back into its um, original um, original shape. But over time, it takes less and less stress to maintain that constant value of strain. So what this means is that over time, there is a conversion of that elastic strain into a plastic strain until in the limit of long time here, it doesn't require any additional stress to maintain uh, that deflection. Or in other words, the glassy sample is permanently uh, strained at that specified level. Now, as this stress decays, this is the stress relaxation process. And if we take these measured stress curves and normalize them by the initial stress, you get this normalized stress relax relaxation function shown on the right, where all three of these curves for three different deflections, they all um, collapse onto a single master curve. And in fact, that master curve uh, perfectly fits the stretched exponential relaxation function with the, the exponent value of three-fifths as predicted by Phillips for um, relaxation in the diffusion trap model with an effective dimensionality of three. Now, if we go forward, uh, we'll see that um, this is a different glass composition. This is according jade glass. 
uh, which is a glass that has a higher glass transition temperature. And now, instead of changing the different deflections, we're changing the uh, temperatures that correspond to the isothermal holds. So 700 degrees C, 735 and 758 degrees C. Of course, at, fat, at higher temperatures, the relaxation occurs on a shorter time scale compared to lower temperatures. But in all of these cases here, the stress relaxation function again fits um, stretch exponential relaxation with an exponent of three fifths. And if you take the characteristic relaxation time and plot that, it follows um, an erroneous behavior as expected for an isostructural system. Now, the interesting thing is, what if we take the same chemistry here, the same Corning jade glass, the same temperatures, 700, 735, and 758 degrees C, but now instead of measuring stress relaxation, we measure um, a volumetric relaxation, which is indicative of structural relaxation. And this is showing, um, or this is, was measured by uh, measuring the density of the glass as a function of time, um, not under stress anymore, but, but this relaxation is just structural relaxation as a result of the thermal disequilibrium of the glass. So there's no applied stress. And if we um, normalize this to our initial densities, this gives us the structural relaxation function, which is shown on the right. Again, all three curves um, exhibit stretched exponential relaxation. But the interesting thing is that the exponent is different. Um, for structural relaxation, the exponent is 3 sevenths. For stress relaxation for the same glasses at the same temperatures, the exponent is three-fifths. So three-fifths comes when you have all, all relaxation pathways activated in three dimensions. Three-sevenths arises um, if only the long-range relaxation pathways are activated. And the difference here in the experimental setup is that in the stress relaxation experiments, the system was under stress, meaning that there is a greater amount of disequilibrium, meaning that there's short and long range pathways activated. Here for structural relaxation, the entire driving force for the relaxation process is the thermodynamic disequilibrium of the glass. So in this case, presumably just the long range pathways are activated, giving beta equals three sevenths. And this is very interesting because you can see these um, different characteristic slopes for stress relaxation experiments in blue versus structural relaxations in green. Um, and these different slopes correspond to those different uh, exponents, three-fifths for stress relaxation, three-sevenths for structural relaxation. And on the right, you can also see that these are happening on very different time scales. This shows the logarithm of the relaxation time. Uh, and for stress relaxation, this is occurring about one or one and a half orders of magnitude faster compared to structural relaxation. Again, this is because in the stress relaxation experiments, there's an applied stress, which leads to short range relaxation pathways plus long range. Whereas for structural relaxation, um, this is just the result of thermodynamic disequilibrium. And it's just the slower long range pathways that are activated. Um, now, a very interesting thing, too, this is an experiment that we did on Corning Gorilla Glass, where we actually observed the Corning Gorilla Glass relaxing at room temperature on a time scale of about one and a half years. These were two um, one meter by one meter sheets of Gorilla Glass stored um, in, in a lab at constant temperature and constant humidity conditions. Uh, and we optically measured the shrinkage of the glass over time. Um, this is a glass that has a glass transition temperature of about 650, no, sorry, 630 degrees Celsius. And so room temperature is more than 600 degrees below its glass transition temperature. And yet what we saw is that over time, the glass was shrinking and it was shrinking by, a, uh, by about 10 ppm on a linear scale. So what this means is that we could observe about 10 microns worth of shrinkage in this um, one meter by one meter um, sheet of glass. Now, the interesting thing here too is that it follows stretched exponential decay. Um, so the dashed red line here shows what you would get if you tried to fit that data to a simple exponential curve, which corresponds to the stretching exponent beta equals one. 
and it's clearly not following simple exponential decay, but with stretched exponential decay and the Phillips value of three sevenths, again, for structural relaxation, there's a perfect fit here between the experimental data and the predicted um, stretched exponential relaxation curve. Uh, however, if we were to look at the viscosity of Gorilla Glass, um, the viscosity curve is shown on the right. This is the logarithm of viscosity versus Tg over T. So the part of the plot that corresponds to Angel's plot is between 0 and 1. And if you continue to extrapolate that, that gives the extrapolated liquid viscosity um, given by the Maega equation. Uh, the non-equilibrium viscosity of the glass is given by the MAP equation. And if we extrapolate this all the way down to room temperature, that predicts a room temperature viscosity of about 10 to the 22 and a quarter Pascal seconds, which is a very high viscosity, much too high for this relaxation behavior to be governed by viscous flow. And what this is showing us is experimental confirmation of a non-viscous relaxation mode, which is called secondary relax relaxation or beta relaxation. This is something that we covered in the chapter on energy landscapes. Um, the second part of that was about um, the minimalist landscape approach where we covered alpha relaxation or primary relaxation that is governed by viscous flow whereas secondary relaxation or beta relaxation is not connected to a viscous relaxation mechanism. In the case of Gorilla Glass, it is related to the mixed alkalis. So this is the presence of both sodium and potassium that somehow leads to uh, a relaxation mode at um, very low temperatures. So this brings us now to um, getting all the pieces put together to have a state-of-the-art glass relaxation model. Uh, we start off with the stretched exponential relaxation function as originally derived by Kohlrausch back in the 1840s and then um, shown to be physically rigorous by Phillips in the 1990s with now um, the stretching exponent beta um, being given by d star over d star plus two. Now, computationally, it's a lot easier if instead of solving the stretched exponential function, we um, represent this uh, in approximate fashion as um, a summation of simple exponential decays, where those simple exponential decays are happening on a um, spectrum of relaxation times. This is what's called a Prony series. A Prony series is a kind of like a Fourier series, but with a Fourier series, you're, you're approximating a function by a summation of sines and cosines. With a Prony series, you're approximating a function as, with a summation of simple exponentials. So in this case, it's taking the simple exponential decay function here and approximating it as a summation of n number of simple exponential decays, where n is usually eight or 12, something of that order. There is a weighting factor here, W sub i for each of the terms, and then some kinetic factor here, K sub i, that governs the different time scales on which these are relaxing. And if you add up all of these weighting factors here, W sub i, the um, summation of all of them would be equal to one. Now what we do is we take tools equation, um, but apply tools equation not for the overall um, fictive temperature, but we assign partial fictive temperatures that correspond to each one of the terms in this Prony series. So if you have n terms in your Prony series, you will have n number of partial fictive temperatures. Each one of those partial fictive temperatures is given by TFI, where this I is the index here for, from the summation. Every one of those partial fictive temperatures relaxes following tools equation. So it is the difference between the actual temperature of the system T minus the partial fictive temperature TFI, and then divided by um, your uh, characteristic relaxa relaxation time here, which is related to the inverse of this Ki parameter. So you've got different partial fictive temperatures that are relaxing on different time scales tau I as governed by this Ki rate parameter in the Prony series. Then the final step is to get the average fictive temperature of the system, and the average fictive temperature TF is just this uh, weighted average of all the partial fictive temperatures, uh, where the weighting factors here are the WIs from the Prony series approximation. So if you put this all together, then 
you get the um, a state of the art glass relaxation model. And the only thing that you need to plug in here is this average relaxation time tau, which is a function of T and TF. And this um, is given by the map equation for the non-equilibrium viscosity that we covered in that particular lecture. So an important distinction here is not to confuse a prony series with a pony series. A pony series on the right here uh, features a lot of different uh, pastel colored ponies. A prony series on the left is a mathematical function that takes um, a summation of simple exponential decays and uses that to approximate some function. So just be careful not to confuse those two. Now, what I'm showing here in this plot is um, the optimized prony series um, coefficients for various cases. This is shown for three different values of beta, so three-fifths, three-sevenths, and one-half, which would be relaxation in two dimensions. Uh, the left-hand plot here is for eight terms in the prony series. The right-hand plot is for 12 terms in the prony series to give a slightly better representation. And both of these graphs show the WIs on the left and then the KIs on the uh, horizontal axis. And so these plots here show you what the values are of the W sub i's and, and the K sub i's that you need to get the best representation of those values of beta for different number of terms in the prony series. So if you want 12 terms of your prony series, with a beta equals three sevenths, you use the um, the KIs and the WIs shown by the blue curve shown here. For those 12 points would be the 12 values. And this shows um, the fit of the stretch exponential decay um, by adding additional terms to the Prony series. N equals one would be a simple exponential decay. And of course that gives a very poor fit to the stretch exponential function. Even just adding the second term, n equals two, gives you a much better representation of the final function. Going to n equals four or n equals eight gives you very good representation. The residuals are shown on the right. The residual here is just the difference between the Prony series representation and the actual stretched exponential decay. Um, very high residual for n equals one, um, fairly high for n equals two, but um, you know it's actually a very accurate representation for a greater number of terms. So if there's quite rapid convergence of the Prony series with an increasing number of terms. Um, this plot shows the log of the root mean squared error of the Prony series fit as a function of the number of terms in the Prony series. So this can be used as a guide if you want to get um, you know, accuracy with this, within a certain level for a certain value of beta. This tells you how many terms that you would need to include in the Prony series. Um, this plot shows, um, so the blue line is for n equals four, four terms in the Prony series, the green one for n equals eight. And this is for as a function of beta, um, going all the way from beta equals zero all the way up through beta equals one. Um, and this is the root mean squared error that you get. So uh, basically the worst error occurs when you've got a beta around 0.3 or so. And if you go either side, it's becoming closer to um, a simple exponential type of decay. Now, if we were to take the first derivative of the relaxation function, um, so the first derivative of the stretched exponential function um, evaluated in the limit of time going to zero. So this would be the initial um, first derivative of the stretched exponential decay function. Um, that derivative is actually um, has the limiting behavior of going to minus infinity. So one of the shortcomings of the Prony series approximation is that if you take that same derivative of the Prony series, it's going to a finite value shown here at the bottom. Um, so this is a, an intrinsic shortcoming of the Prony series approach is that it cannot capture the first derivative or that the very steep initial slope. Um, in the short time limit. And so that, that's really the biggest deficiency. Um, other than that, it is actually a rather good approximation. This shows um, the slope of the relaxation function. So that's the first derivative and on the left, and then the, resi the corresponding residuals. And you can see that these residuals kind of blow up in the um, zero time limit. And that's because um, the Prony series cannot capture that divergence and slope of the stretch exponential function at zero time. Now, I mentioned earlier that the Kohlrausch stretch exponential function is also called the Kohlrausch-Williams-Watts function. 
that's because there were um uh, there was a bunch of work published by Williams and Watts doing a frequency domain analysis of um, the stretch exponential function. There's actually no analytical solution um, for the Fourier transform of the stretched exponential function. But for the Prony series representation, you can take the Fourier transform of that. And um, that's given by, um, by this equation here at the bottom. And so the Prony series is also convenient for doing a frequency domain analysis because you can um, take that, uh, take an analytical Fourier transform. And if we compare that to a numerically evaluated Fourier transform of the stretch exponential function, it actually gives a pretty good representation um, in both the real part of the spectrum shown on the left and the imaginary part of the spectrum on the right. Um, N equals one, again, corresponds to simple exponential decay, and then it rapidly converges um, to the real stretch exponential decay for larger values of N. And if you um, take the um, you know the square of the real plus the imaginary parts of the spectrum, you can get the power spectral density of the stretched exponential decay function, where again, you can see the um, rapid convergence here with increasing number of terms in the Prony series. Now, all of this is implemented in a software tool called RelaxPy. This is an open source relaxation modeling tool that implements everything that I've covered today. Um, this is open source, it's free. Uh, anyone can go and download it and use it. So you are welcome to do so at um, the link shown here. So to summarize, um, the non-equilibrium state of the glass or polymer system is typically described by fictive temperature, but different people mean different things when they say fictive temperature. There's the microscopic interpretation, macroscopic, and kinetic interpretation. What I presented today is a, a state-of-the-art glass or polymer relaxation model based on a Prony series approximation of the stretch exponential function in the context of the kinetic description of um, fictive temperature, where the average fictive temperature is given by an average of multiple partial fictive temperatures, where each of those partial fictive temperatures relaxes according to tools equation, and they each correspond to one term in the Prony series. All right, that does it for now. If you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I will see you next time. Thank you very much.